Good morning, everybody. My name is Aaron Witt. I run a company called BuildWit. Randy Blunt, I am the CFO of BuildWit. We're here to talk to you all about an equipment manager's role in overcoming the workforce challenge we're facing. We're gonna talk about some tangible things you can do as an equipment manager today, tomorrow, next week to start making a significant difference. These are the three takeaways I want you to have, okay? So, what can I do more of? What can I do less of? And what can I do differently? A human problem requires a human approach. It's, it's a human problem. We're really good at, at what we can measure, equipment, hours, and, and depreciation, and fuel burn, and, and, and wear and tear. We can measure all of that, but people, we can't measure it. It's squishy. That's why it's so special. That's why human beings are capable of such amazing things. Hey, I need to be better at, do more of, speaking about mental health. Write it down, and make sure when you leave here that you do it. Right? So often we come to these conferences and we, we walk away and we say, oh, that was so good. But then we don't do anything. Do more, do less, do differently. Don't, don't try and change the world. Come up with one or two things in each category from this conference that you can really focus on and actually accomplish. Awesome. Before we get into our main message, a little bit about us to provide you some context. Here is a photograph from my sixth birthday party. I've always loved heavy equipment, but I didn't grow up around it. My dad was a tax lawyer. When I was evaluating what the heck to do with my life in high school, senior year, a construction project popped up in my neighborhood, big concrete pipe, huge pipe, um, forklift, 385 excavator. It was a wealthier part of town, so everybody was all pissed off about it, but I just loved it. I I loved everything about it. So I call him up, I meet with Mr. Pearson, and I ask him three things. One, what should I study in college? Because I have no idea. Two, how do you become a contractor? Because I think this is really cool and I want to do it too. And three, can I have a job? I started as a laborer in a pipe crew, had never been on a construction site before this, didn't own a pair of pants before this, and I just did what I, you know, did my best. I, I put my head down, I worked hard. The crew took me in, they taught me every bad word in Spanish there is to know, and I, I knew that this industry was for me after this summer. It was just a matter of figuring out where. I worked for five different companies while I was in school. So I did a few years as a laborer operator out in the field. I built bridges with Skanska in California, drill and blast with Kiwit in Washington, and then went to work in road construction out of school. I wanted to be a contractor, because how hard can it be? So that was my plan. Save up, buy a skid steer, become a contractor. And uh, everything started to go horribly wrong when I started to share some of my pictures and experiences on the internet. I, I wanted to go tell a story about the construction industry. I thought it was cool, and I didn't see a lot of storytelling. It's like, hey, we want to go attract the next generation, but no one's, no one's talking about what we're doing. We got to talk about what the heck we do. These, these kids don't even know this exists. I didn't know this existed. Um, after about eight months of, of real world experience, very seasoned at this point, I decided to quit my job, move back in with my parents. They were thrilled with me, very proud. And I told them, hey, mom and dad, I'm gonna run around the country and take pictures of bulldozers. So that's what I did, that's where it started five years ago. Me messaging many of you on social media saying, hey, I'm this kid, I love what you do, can I come out and take pictures of, of your tractors? Most of you would say, kick rocks. But every once in a while, I'd get the one yes, I'd go to wherever that yes was, I'd take the pictures, I'd share them with them, and maybe if I was lucky, they'd even, they'd even pay me. So that was the genesis of Buildwood. And it's just a little bit about me. So here, here's two pictures. Uh, the one on the left is actually my dad. He's on a, a drill rig in West Texas. So uh, my dad, he dropped out of high school uh, and went to the oil fields to go make money. Uh, so I actually came from the hospital to, this, to the drill rig where my dad was working. Uh, he taught me how to work really hard. Uh, just an incredibly hardworking individual. Uh, I worked with him on Thanksgiving. I worked with him on Christmas Eve, on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Uh, and I also heard from him, hey, if I had one thing I would have changed, it would not work so much. Uh, born in 1985, so I'm a young, I'm an older millennial, but I'm a millennial. Guess what? I don't want to work as much as my dad because my dad told me not to. So when we think about this workforce development, a lot of times I hear us say, hey, 
the millennials don't want to work as much or the Gen Zs don't want to work as much, remember, a lot of you in this room contributed to that because you've told your kids, hey, if I could do something different, I wouldn't work quite so much. Uh, he got sick when I was 21 and uh, I had to take over the family business. And um, one of the things that I decided because I thought it was a good idea was we needed to have a brand. And so we said, hey, it shouldn't be that expensive to go out and paint all of your equipment gray, right? And so we did. Uh, we started small and before we knew it, our entire fleet was gray. Uh, Aaron was recently in uh, Switzerland yep. and a guy in Switzerland knew about us, right? So we had started to create a brand. We were acquired um, by W.W. Clyde, a nearly 100-year-old 100 100 company, great company, great people. And I worked for them for about two years uh, for that transition before I came on to BuildWit full-time. Um, so on the right there was some of the branding that BuildWit helped us uh, put together. And uh, I love it. Uh, if you ever want to talk about marketing or branding, uh, I'll geek out with you. So come, come grab me afterwards. I think you'll touch more on the gray equipment a little bit here. Yep. Um, to explain BuildWit, I have, I don't have very much life experience, I'm 28 years old, but I get to go to a lot of amazing places. So I've traveled for the past five years to job sites, mines uh, around the country and around the world just about every single week. I, I don't have a family, I don't have kids, I don't have a dog, I just run around and look at dirt is what I tell people. Some of the cool stuff I've seen the past year, Switzerland, that was uh, about midnight, uh, Zurich International Airport, that's a 390 demolishing the runway. About five minutes before that was happening, there was a plane landing in that exact exact spot. And then they had to replace the concrete with asphalt. By 6 a.m. plans would be landing there. Again, $20,000 a minute in LDs. They did this 70 times in a row to replace the entire runway. It was the most coordinated uh, project I'd ever seen in my life. Spectacular. Uh, we've been to Alberta a few times now. This was in January, middle of January. It's minus 20, minus 30. They're running full bore. The haul roads are hard during the winter. It's frozen, so that's when they get their peak production. 400 ton trucks mining oil sand. There's about 400 barrels of oil in the back of that truck. It was spectacular to see. And then Saudi Arabia, I've been to the Middle East a few times now, and they're developing as a, as a country, which is spectacular to see literally hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars of getting spent in, in the middle of nowhere. That's a fleet of D9s, D11s pushing off the top of that, that cliff there to build a road down below where they're, of course, creating a Formula One track because what else would you put in the middle of nowhere? And um, if you look really closely, the operators are sitting on their prayer mats because it's prayer time. So they stop. Everything's idling there, unfortunately. But they get out. They pray right in the cut. They go back to work. So I get to see a lot of amazing places, and everything I talk about is, is informed by all of the amazing people I get to meet, like you all, and all of the amazing work I get to see. I have a, a unique perspective on the industry. Um, our team now, it started with me taking pictures. We have about 75 full-time people, me and Randy, and a bunch of others, just all amazing folks, probably another 50 or so part-time. So it's really grown significantly. We do marketing work, we do media work, and we do now training software for the heavy construction and mining industries. And the software piece is, is the newest part of our business. We've developed a specific, a purpose-built training platform for the industry, and not only have we built the platform, but we've developed in the past year about 1,200 training videos. And I don't say all of this as this, as this uh, cleverly veiled sales pitch. I say all of this because we're about to say, hey, to solve this workforce challenge, it's on you, it's on you, it's on you, it's on you, it's on me, it's on him, it's on all of us. And we're doing our part, I promise. We're doing everything we can to make a difference here. We're not in the industry, we're serving it from the outside from a different perspective, but we're doing everything we can, we promise. We wouldn't come up here and tell you all, hey, this is what you need to do without practicing it first. So today, we're gonna get into why we have this problem. Before we can solve it, we need to understand kind of the foundational issue here. We're gonna talk about why. We're gonna talk about why it's, I think, a great opportunity. We can sit here and say, oh, this sucks, or we can sit here and say, what if this is an amazing opportunity? And I believe it is a fantastic opportunity, the biggest opportunity our industry has seen in probably 50 plus years. And then we're gonna talk about what you can do as an equipment manager today to start making a difference. On, on that, Aaron. So I think one of the, you, most of the people here, they're, they're aware of the SWOT analysis and the, the four quadrants. The, the most effective SWOT analysis is when you find, to take a way, find a way to take a weakness or a threat 
and move it across to a strength, right? And so that's what he's talking about. Hey, this, this is a weakness right now. This is a threat. It, it's real. But we have the opportunity to take advantage of that and make it a strength. And that's what we're going to tr- try and help you guys understand. So the dirt world, let's define the dirt world. Everybody thinks it's just earth moving. That is a subsect of the dirt world, but we wanted a better term than heavy civil or underground or something to encapsulate everything. We just made it up. We called it the dirt world. The dirt world is natural resources. It's underground. It's, it's roads and bridges. It's everything that we do. It's, it's critical infrastructure. It's critical to everyday life. If I think about today, I woke up, I turned the lights on, I I put some water on my face, I ran on a road, I showered, I drove here, we're sitting in a building built on a solid foundation, fed by utilities. The dirt world is the fabric of society. It's essential, it's essential. But society often forgets how essential it is because we've always had it in our lives. We even, we do it every day, but we sometimes forget how important what we do is. This is bigger, Solving this problem is much bigger than us and our companies. This is about society. We can't just tell society, oh, hey, sorry, we just couldn't figure out how to give you infrastructure anymore. That's not an option. We're essential. This is from 2017, a few years ago, but this is some of the best data around. NCCR estimates 41% of the current construction workforce will be retired by the year 2031. So there are over half a million people needed just this year to keep up with demand. Half a million people. And we have a massive looming retirement. We all know this. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. But we just said we're essential. So we don't have the option to just sit here and throw our hands up in the air. We have to do something. And even if you're good to go, hey, I'm retiring in two years. This isn't really a big problem for me. Just think about it from your children's perspective. How successful can your children be if they don't have consistent infrastructure? That's what we do. This is, this is a big deal. We have to figure this out. But it's a scary challenge. It's scary. And if you're scared about this, you're not alone. Just about everybody I meet is also scared. But again, we can take it from a risk, a threat, and turn it into an amazing asset. One other thing on this study that's interesting to note is they also found that they, they, they estimate 11 years to take somebody who has not been in the industry to journeyman level operator mechanic, right? So uh, not only is it we have a a demographic that's leaving, but we also have this urgency that needs to take place in getting people upskilled, getting them trained, because it takes time, right? And anybody who has a master mechanic can tell you that. It it just, there's something about the experience that's really, really valuable. So the why, if you look at 1917, the biggest companies, sectors of our economy, steel, oil, and gas mining. We were a manual economy. We took raw inputs and we created things. That's what we do as an industry. We take raw inputs and we create things. But World War II came about and then globalization followed and now we had access to outside labor markets, materials, other countries that we could leverage. So we took a lot of the making things and we put it elsewhere in the world which then freed up our human capital to go do other things like technology, financial services, medicine. And we transitioned as a, to a knowledge economy. We're now a knowledge economy. So the world has changed dramatically because of this. We're still in this manual world, but we're now us. We are manual workers, but we're now living in this knowledge world. And what's happened as a result is the economy's boomed. That's why life is so good right now. The past few decades have been the most prosperous in human history. We are amazingly comfortable as a result. We're living large. This is our GDP. It just keeps going up because we've freed up that human capital to go innovate, create, do other things than sitting on an assembly line. But there's also downsides to it. We've, as we've moved people from rural America and, and grown, we've moved people into cities, the birth rates decline substantially. The workforce participation has declined substantially. And here's the result, or one of the results, older people projected to outnumber children for the first time in U.S. history. That's by 2034, for the first time in U.S. history. So we're all sitting around asking, you know, wh- where did all the young people go? The answer is there's, there's less today than there have been per percentage basis. Our world has changed. And so we can sit here and keep lying to ourselves and just keep saying, oh, well, it's just, they just don't want to work or what we're doing is perfectly fine. But the reality is the world has dramatically changed. It's only going further in this direction. So until we say, hey, 
okay, we understand that. We might have to change a little bit. As a result, we're gonna have the same issue. It's only gonna get worse. You know, I, I have four kids and uh, I don't want anyone here to think what Aaron just says, that means you need to go home and have a conversation with your spouse about having more kids. That's not one of the new mores, okay? <laughs> it could be a solution, but I don't, I, don't, I don't want that to be on me. Like. Um, but <clears throat> before we get into solutions, this is why I'm so optimistic. I read a lot of studies, a lot of articles, and this is a, a article from the Washington Post about job satisfaction and construction was among the highest. And that's because, sure, we're in this knowledge world now today, but I think human beings are designed to go work hard, to create things, to work outside, to work along other people. I think what we have is amazing. We serve an amazing purpose in society. We're essential. I think we can overcome this challenge. I'm extremely optimistic. I don't, even, I don't have a choice. I still have 30, 40 years ahead of me. But we really can do this. Yes, it is scary. Yes, it is this big problem. Yes, it's going to require some things from us that are a little different. But we can do this because we have this amazing purpose and we have this industry that I think is really geared towards human nature, towards what this next generation wants, which is, again, that purpose. All right. Uh, who here recognizes this photo? Anybody want to guess where this is? Panama Canal. Panama Canal. There's some books on this. Panama Canal is incredible. Uh, it's a really, really cool story. Um, one of the things I think is interesting is when we, begin, when we begin to talk about stuff like this, sometimes our body language goes to this, and we start to think like, oh, who's, who are these people up here talking about we need to do this differently? Like, who's calling me out for doing it wrong? I want to be clear, we're not saying you, you all have done it wrong. What we're saying is times have changed. It's time we change with them. As you look at this picture, I don't think anybody here would argue that the Panama Canal was incredible. It is an engineering feat. But look how they're building it. Would you build it that way today? Lots of no's, right? Lots of nodding no's. We wouldn't. And that doesn't mean that they didn't do a great job. They did the best they could with what they had. We have different, different tools now, we'll do it differently. The same is true when it comes to workforce development. The way it worked when you were in the industry might not be the same as, as those who are coming into the industry. So now we have to say, what different tools do we have? What have we learned? What do we understand about psychology? How do we apply that so we can do it differently? Pay homage to all the great men and women who've got our industry to where it is, because it is an incredible place. But now, let's look to how do we do better moving forward. So the solution, this is the best picture I came up with for what's going on in the industry, I feel like, right now. Everybody's kind of pointing at the next guy. Is it, are you going to do something? Are you going to do something? Everybody's hoping someone else is going to do something about it. Someone else is going to swoop in and save the day. But there, there's no one that's coming to save us. There's no one that cares. There's no one coming. It's on us. So until we sit there, look ourselves in the mirror and say, that's who's responsible. No matter where we sit in this industry, that's who's responsible for solving this problem, for overcoming this challenge. It's not going to get better. It's on all of us. There's no easy button here. There's no one coming to save us. It's on us as individuals. It's on us as companies to figure this out because all of society is depending on us. And so I'm going to talk about it from a big picture, and Randy's going to get into a little bit more granular from a, an equipment manager standpoint. A human problem requires a human approach. It's, it's a human problem. We're really good at, at what we can measure, equipment, hours, and, and depreciation, and fuel burn, and, and, and wear and tear. We can measure all of that, but people, we can't measure it. It's squishy, but that's why it's so special. That's why human beings are capable of such amazing things. And so I study a lot of psychology, and this is the Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And you start on the bottom, physiological needs. And then once you have those physiological needs, food, water, shelter, which is our industry, you can then start to progress from there. So then you go to safety needs, you go to belongingness and love, your relationships, you go to esteem, feeling of prestige, accomplishment, and ultimately the top is something called self-actualization, which I've renamed to excellence. Becoming all that you can be as a human being. 
And that should be our goal as humans. I want to become all that I can be. I want to develop myself. That's why I'm talking to all of you right now. I want to get on the path and grow to becoming all that I can be. But as leaders in this industry, our goal should be helping those that we lead, all of those that are running the equipment we manage, to become all that they can be as well. If we help our people become all that they can be, grow not just as operators or mechanics, but as human beings, we can dramatically shift things in a, a very short amount of time. You know, as, as he was talking about suicide prevention, you probably heard him actually talking about this very thing. So you look at safety needs and physiological needs, at times we don't do those well in construction, right? And if we aren't doing those well, it leads to some of these nervous breakdowns or feel, feeling overwhelmed. So when we think about how do we take this human approach and how do we like, examine our organizations, we need to go back and say, hey, where am I not hitting the box on these bottom ones? They're foundational. And if I'm not, if I'm not checking the box there, how do I make a difference there? How do I make sure um, rest? What's the solution in construction when you have a tough schedule? Somebody? Work more, right? Hey, we gotta get this engine swapped out. Sorry, you're pulling a double shift, right? And we, maybe, maybe some of you say, hey, that's not my organization. Broadly as an industry, that's the easy button. More hours. Also, we, we say, hey, uh, this is a high paying industry. Well, it is. But when you work 60 hours, right? So we have to be really honest with ourselves. Instead of just saying, hey, this is the place where you get paid well, you, you, there, everything you do is matters, all this. Hey, where, where can we do, what can we do different? Where can we be better? So on a big picture, and this applies to, to most of this room, there's a, a, a quote, it's something along the lines of, you know, first you, you want to find your path and then you want to develop yourself along that path and then you, you, you ultimately you find your gift, you develop it, and you come to the, the point in your career, your life, where, where it's on you to give it, give it away. Give it away. And so as leaders in this industry, we really need to think about, especially before we're on our way out, what do we want our legacy to be? What do we want our legacy to be? Your legacy is whatever you leave behind. But if you're walking off with everything you've, you've learned along the way, you haven't left it behind, you haven't given it away, you're doing everyone a disservice. You're setting the industry up to fail. And this, 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 this generation, they learn differently. Like today, we can't throw wrenches at people. That's, that's, that's illegal, potentially. You can't throw wrenches. Maybe you had wrenches thrown at you. And so the belief is, well, this next generation, they have to learn like I learned. The school of hard knocks. They need some wrenches thrown at them. They just don't get it. But what does that do? That helps nobody. We're letting ego get in the way. So are we going to let ego get in the way of, of setting this up, industry up long term, of setting society up long term? Or can we do better as leaders to give what we have away? And are we doing this frequently? Is this an everyday process? Did I today, me as a leader, me as an equipment manager, give something that I've learned along the way away to somebody else? And if I haven't, I need to start. Because if I walk off with even one little thing I've learned along the way with me, that's gone forever. That's gone forever. So big picture, how can we as individuals, how can we as individuals give what we have away to that next generation as quickly and effectively as possible? And if we're not doing it every day, we're not doing as much as we can be. Right now, I just need people to do something that they're not comfortable with, which is just yell out, what are some of the things that you think make an equipment manager? What are some of the skills you need, some of the tasks you do? Go. Coaching. Coaching. Great. Equipment specifications. Equipment specifications. Managing mechanics. Managing mechanics. Rates. Rates. Schedule. Starting up projects. Schedule. Starting up projects. Listening. Okay, I'm getting old, you can tell. <laughs> Listening. Replacing steps on machines. Which I was not doing. Uh, replacing steps on machines. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, that's like the, the bane of everybody's existence. Can I tell you one of the things I think is really unique about this? This role of equipment manager, I think, has more connection with the company 
than, uh, often than anybody else in the company. They're positioned in the middle, every job needs equipment, and they have mechanics who do report to them that go to every job. I, I, please challenge me. I say if you want a rumor started, this is where you start. <laughs> right? You can start a rumor and it spreads like wildfire. And we all joke because we all know it happens. And it's not that we intentionally start a rumor, but some mechanic comes in and says, hey, I was out at this job, and Timmy, he is a dumbass. Karen step, steps off every day, need to get him fired. Well, then guess what? You repeat that story, some mechanic goes out to Glenn's job, tells Glenn the job about Timmy, and when Timmy shows up, guess what Glenn thinks? What does he think? He's a dumbass. He's a dumbass. <laughs> right? Well, this is one of the ways we can coach. We have to be an influence for good in our company. You have such a unique position to stop rumors, to stop backbiting, to teach mechanics how to do more than complain about things that are broken, right? I get it. I, the company was doing $4 million in revenue when I took over, and when I left, it was, the division was doing $100 million. I had to, at $4 million, go fix some of those things, and it was maddening. Water hydrant meters pulled off of hydrants. Oh my gosh, maddening, but guess what? I've done it, right? It just happens. Rare are leaders of organizations who will tell you that their people don't matter. However, there's a big difference between understanding the value of people inside an organization and actually making decisions that consider their needs. It's like saying, my kids are my priority but always putting work first. When we say our people matter, but we don't actually care for them, it can shatter trust and create a culture of paranoia, cynicism, and self-interest. Everybody matters. Yeah, so this comes from the book Everybody Matters, which I think Aaron and I recommend pretty much everybody. Yeah. Life-changing book, book. Gr great book. So might be a good note, if you haven't read it, it's in Audible if you, you guys get plenty of windshield time. Listen to it or read it. All right, so um, equipment manager. Interesting title, because really I think you're people managers. We, we, like, we like equipment, that's why we're in the industry. But really when it comes down to it, equipment for the most part runs and operates pretty well. Most of the time we're dealing with people who are fixing mistakes by people. How do we say people matter, but we don't show it? And this isn't, hey, I'm, you know, I'm going to say all the bad things about my organization. But as an industry as a whole, how do, we, how do we miss the mark here? What do we say? We say people matter, but how do we miss? I think, hey, we just, we just said, hey, uh, somebody is, if they are awake for 18 hours straight, they are as impaired as being legally drunk. Who here thinks they've probably had somebody in their organization who's been up 18 hours straight? Me? Do we ever think about it? Do we do much to change it? Good, right? So, so there, there's, there's these things that we, we know, we say our people matter, but yet then our actions don't align. As an industry, we tend to overwork our people, right? I'm glad we have people who are doing something about it, uh, that, that are making a difference. Um, I also think, you know, he talked about throwing a wrench. It's, it's a proverbial wrench. Do you know what the turnover is in the first year in construction? Anybody want to take a guess? North of three quarters of the people who enter the industry leave in the first year. Not because we're throwing wrenches, but maybe we're not making them feel welcome. Maybe when they don't know what they're supposed to do, we, instead of teaching, we belittle. I've, I've seen it on crews. I've probably been guilty of it. It's kind of funny to make fun of the new guy. Well, this generation doesn't appreciate that, and they got opportunity. I told you, it's, not, it's, it's a knowledge-based economy now. Well, I can go work somewhere else, make similar money, and not have to drive, not have to worry what state am I working in or what city. 
Yeah, and, and caring is, is simple too. I think equipment managers, it's easy to get caught up in the office with everything we have going on. There's, there's all sorts of stuff that, that we have to manage and, and, and maybe we talk to our, our mechanics, but do we get out into the field every once in a while and just shake people's hands? You know, great, equipment's getting torn up and that's where our, our time's spent and we have to do this, but do we get out there and, and, and thank people? Hey, thanks for not scratching the counterweight. That, you know, that your machine is always in such good condition. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And you shake that, their hand and just say thank you. Look them right in the eyes. That's all people need is just a little appreciation. And then to me as an individual that says, wow, they really do care. And then when that $1 raise does come down, I'm going to think twice about it. Because, hey, I have the money I need. And, hey, they actually care about me. Which is, I've never been cared for. I've been, I've been around 20 years and no one's ever cared for me like this. So I don't need that dollar raise. I'm going to stay right where I am. Um, so, sometimes that caring is, is really e like easy to manifest. Like we, one of the things we did is we had a boot voucher. We gave $150 every year to our people to help buy a pair of boots. And I know other companies do it. But those little things make a difference. You would be shocked what an extra hat and t-shirt does for people. They appreciate it. And it doesn't have to be for any reason. Just thank you for your hard work. Um, all right, so here's, a, here's an interesting thing when it comes to training. Uh, Another volunteer to read? Where's that mic at? Would you mind just reading it since you have the mic? Sure. A study from Construction Industry Institute's research team found that every 1% of the project labor budget that is invested in training, productivity increases by 1%. Sorry, that's 11. I didn't place that text. Oh, I didn't Sorry. place that text oh. really good. <laughs> no, your eyesight's great. I missed. <laughs> Uh, 11%. That's a crazy number. I actually don't believe it. Hopefully nobody hears from the Construction Industry Institute. Please say no. I don't believe that number. I, so I, when, I run, uh, when I run calculations, I use like 4% because I want to be super, super conservative. Do you know what this means? This means if you create budget for training, it is a cost reduction. Now in construction, we're not good at spending money if it's not in the job budget, it's not in the equipment budget. So if you don't have a budget for training, you need to leave here and say, how do we create a pool of dollars that's based off equipment hours, that's based off of job labor budget, whatever the metric is that gives me a pool of money so at, in my meetings I can review with my executive, my team, hey, we have this many dollars in training and we're not using it. Because what happens so often in companies, and I get to view them all over the country, is we don't, we don't, we don't have enough money to do that. Well, you will if you start budgeting it. And, and, and training, it, it's based on a lot of all the simplest stuff. I just talked to a guy that was fired the other day because he put diesel fuel in the wrong tank on, on the new loader. And he said it was a genuine mistake. He didn't know what he was doing. And he doesn't want to be the idiot. So of course you're gonna, you're gonna do your best and, and maybe you're rushed at the end of the day or whatever it is. You put it in the wrong tank, fired. No questions about it. But he's like, I didn't, I didn't know which one was, was which. And me, you know, I was 18 years old on the job site for the first time. I wanted to do a good job, but no one showed me how to do things. I didn't know how to run a, a cutoff saw. I didn't know how to start a backhoe. I didn't know how to do anything. I had to start with the basics. So as equipment managers, where can we start educating our people even just on the basics? What can we do better from a training standpoint so that, hey, you know, maybe we, here's the top three things from a damage standpoint. You know, maybe, maybe steps keep getting ripped off all the time. How can we train the operators instead of swearing at people? How can we train operators on things they can do to prevent that exact incident right there? This happens all the time. Um, before we get to this, this, uh, this statistic here, I know you're all going to read it. Uh, so one of the things that I think helped me in my career was uh, questions, okay? So there's, there's a skill when it comes to questions. There's actually different types of questions. I'm gonna run through just really quick three tips that I think help you train and develop people. All right, you ready? Question type number one, knowledge or search. You ask a question that helps people basically tell you what something is. So for example, Hey, why, uh, what, what broke on that machine? They tell you. There's a right or a wrong answer. You know what broke, right? Okay, why do you think it broke? These are, these are analyzed questions. You start to help the individual 
use those muscles to analyze, well, well, what might have happened, right? There's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. They're gonna give you a few reasons. You might respond, oh, those are great. Those are great uh, observations. I also think maybe this could have caused that issue, okay? Then they get done and you say, okay, now that you know that, this is an apply question. You're gonna apply what you just learned. Now that you know that, what are you gonna do different? How, how can we train differently? How can we educate differently? Right? Those three types of questions, do you know what they do? They get them to think like you. Right? They, they, it pulls back the curtain of your mind and they say, oh, he's, he's trying to understand what's the issue? What might have caused the issue? And how will I be different because I know that now? Okay? So search, analyze, apply. Three types of questions that can help. All right. Uh, 87% of, of, of the millennials rate professional or career growth, growth and development opportunities as important to them in their job. That's more than three quarters of millennials. And millennials, not quite yet, but pretty soon, make up the largest portion of the workforce, right? Yeah. Within the next year or two, I think. So uh, we, we've, you know, we, we also, also have Gen Z as well in the workforce, and, and they represent a large portion of the workforce. But look, taking training and professional growth, this is how it can become a strength, right? 87% of your people that are millennials want, want to do this. Yeah, I, I poll a lot of people asking, why did you leave your company or industry? Thousands of people at this point. And uh, top three is, I didn't feel like I could grow in the organization I was in. And I know a lot of these organizations, and I know there's a lot of growth ahead of these people that, that left, but there's a disconnect there. They didn't feel like they could grow. And so do we have those conversations with our people? Where do they want to go, or do we just assume? Do we just assume? And maybe we talk to the people in the office. Do we talk to the people in the field? Where do you want to go? You know, entry-level mechanic? Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? And how can I help you develop not just skills, but also in life as a human being? How can we grow people? How can we develop people more effectively? All right, nearly half of millennials say they leave their job for one that offered professional development. So speaking to the same, this same thing. Hey, if, if I got a, a job, probably equal money, and they said, hey, here's your career path. This is how we're gonna get you to the next level. Over half would leave. Yeah, and we talk a lot about recruiting, but I talked with a big dealer the other day. They said their, their turnover is 40% for the year. We need to stop the turnover before we work on recruiting and say we, we reduce the turnover by half. You know, if you have 100 people, you're turning over 40 people. Now it's 20. Now you only have to recruit 20 technicians that are damn near impossible to find right now as opposed to 40. Just simply, potentially, by making sure that we're caring for them and helping them grow however they want to grow. Helping them figure out where they want to grow. Maybe they don't even know. They're just frustrated. How can we work with them, talk with them to figure out where they even want to go? And, and we're, we're, we're not naive. We're, well, <laughs> we are naive. But... Not as naive as maybe we look like we are. Um, so this isn't easy, right? We're, we're telling you things that are simple, but almost everything in life that is simple requires an incredible amount of discipline, which makes it hard, right? But the solution's simple. It, it's, hey, how do we care for our people more? Part of caring for them more is helping them understand how do they reach their full potential and uh, career development is one of those ways. 78% of employees said they would remain longer with their employer if they saw a career path within the current organization. So once again, just reiterating the same point in a different way, different institute doing their study. Like all of us have seen statistics and we're like, well, I saw the opposite statistic from somebody else, right? This here is showing three, three different organizations basically telling us the same thing. People care about career development. And broad brush, within an equipment department, it's not always easy to see that. Especially some of you who are union contractors, it creates a whole other dynamic. My mechanics are union, we're not. What does that look like? How do, we, how do they progress from a union mechanic into the office if they want? You know, it, it's, it's complex and we recognize that. 
But even, again, we get uh, caught up in thinking just professional development. Maybe I don't, as a mechanic, I don't want to be an equipment manager. I'm happy being a mechanic. But people want to grow in general, so maybe you can help me grow financially speaking. Because maybe I'm, I'm missing my mortgage payment, for example. Now, if, I, if I'm missing my mortgage payment, frankly, I don't care about how effective I am at work. I can't focus. So safety, efficiency, that's not top of mind. Missing my mortgage payment is top of mind because my family might not have somewhere to live. And then I hear a lot of times from the industry, well, these people just don't know how to manage their money. It's because no one's taught them. Their parents didn't teach them. They don't know. Their parents don't know how to manage money. They didn't get it in school. They never got it. So maybe how can we as organizations, as equipment managers, just teach our people basic life skills? as something as simple as managing money more effectively. It's not always career development. It's just growth and development in general. <laughs> yeah, so, so on that, one of the things that we, we would, one of our core values that, so Clyde Companies owns WW Clyde. Is anyone here from those organizations? Do you have anyone from Clyde Companies here today? Uh, their mission is to uh, build a better community. And, and we talked about this a lot, um, how, Building a better community is a great mission, but helping people connect with it was important. And so, uh, just like Aaron was talking about, one of the conversations we'd often have is we would say, hey, you know, our mission is to build a better community. But what does that mean for you, laborer, operator, mechanic? That means we want you to become the best human being that you can be. And that means that as a company, we want to support you and becoming that human being. We're gonna try and help you become better at communicating. We're gonna try and help you become better at uh, having critical conversations when there's uh, stress or there's conflict. We're gonna help teach you a skill. That skill is gonna grow and change as you grow in the organization. We're gonna teach you how to coach. Why? Because that's how we make a better community. Because as you're a better human being, you go out into the community and you become a better coach. You become a better volunteer at your church. You make a difference at your kid's school. You go serve in the organization. And so sometimes, and this is hit on in Everybody Matters, sometimes we, we have this itch to do something more. But our greatest sphere of influence is with the people we work with. Often it's our largest network. Often we have the greatest amount of influence because we spend the most amount of time with them. So if we say, well, hey, how could I, how could I work on influencing those I work with? That's how you'll make the world a better place. Um, so gray equipment, first of all, uh, one of the questions I often get asked is why gray? Um, I also get told like, hey, it's not very high visibility. Um, so I, I've heard it all, people love it or hate it. Uh, I don't have a good reason behind the gray. I saw it on a Ferrari and I was like, that's a cool color. So <laughs> afterwards I'm like, oh, it's tough. It's industrial, people will rhyme some of the Navy, like all kinds of stuff. The truth is, I just thought it was a cool color. Um, but what was interesting is we had a truck we had bought at auction, probably like, this is probably 15 years ago. It was like an F650 mechanics truck, and we painted it gray. It was our first piece of equipment that we painted gray. And all of a sudden, I started getting phone calls. And it was like, wow, your new truck looks good. I'm like, well... We just put some lipstick on the pig. Like it's not, not, a, not, a new, not a new truck. And then we painted a few pieces of equipment. And then we did our trucks. And then we did some more. And then I started getting phone calls and texts from clients. They started saying stuff like, hey, saw your equipment on this job. Looks great. Or we interviewed for, for a job at the airport. And they said, hey, we're going to pick you guys because we just think you're just bigger than the other guys. They were like 10 times our size, right? But they saw our jobs. They recognized them. It was, they, they saw they were different. Now, I'm not telling you that because I want everyone to leave here and paint their equipment gray, okay? That's not the point of this. Although, I like gray equipment. I probably wouldn't care. Uh, I'm telling you this because what we realized was when we started to put an emphasis on our equipment, the perception changed, right? So like our counterweights, a machine's counterweights got scratched. All of our mechanics had gray in a rattle can, and we fixed it. Because when somebody gets in a dirty piece of machinery and it's just trashed, they treat it different. And so sometimes what we have to do is we have to change the perception first to get the buy-in. So you might leave here 
And you might say, we're going to be better at caring for our people. Well, that's a process. That's going to take time. So sometimes you might have to go ahead and show what your plan is, where you're headed, and then ask people, hey, I need you to start rowing with me. I need you to get on board with me. I know tomorrow we're not going to be the most caring organization. We're not going to do this perfectly, but we have a goal. This is where we want to be. This is who we want to become. And if all of you can row with us, we'll get there. I think this, this group has amazing influence in our industry. Some are doing better than others, but we all have a role to play, all of us, in overcoming this workforce challenge. It's not this attract problem. It's not just pay people more money. It comes down to caring for our people. If we create people, a workforce that is cared for, appreciated, proud, they're gonna go out to the communities, they're gonna talk about the industry, they're gonna talk about the company they work for, and we're going to be able to attract the people that we need. And this isn't theory. I've seen plenty of companies from small, medium, large do just this. Just a few years ago, they recognized, hey, the play we're running right now, it's been great up until now, but it's not gonna work going forward, so we need to change. They changed from the top, and now, they are more profitable than ever before. They're having more fun than ever before. Their equipment damage is way down. They don't have a retention problem, an attraction problem. This isn't theory. I see this in our industry every week. It's still a rarity. We still all need to act as a collective industry, but it's possible. It's very possible. This is a problem that we can overcome, and so we as individuals need to ask ourselves, what can we do? And maybe I'm doing great right now, but what can I do even more of? How can I more effectively teach that next generation? How can I more effectively inspire people to take care of their machines, to grow as individuals? So if nothing else, what can we all do as individuals today, tomorrow, next week to start caring for people more, caring for people differently to get to that future that, that we need and more importantly, society needs, our children need. So just two closing thoughts, and then we have five to 10 minutes for questions. So uh, one, know that when you leave here, like say, for example, you wrote down, hey, I like that question thing. And you're like, I'm just gonna go do that. Well, that's easier said than done. Uh, you say, I'm gonna go have these conversations and I'm gonna ask better questions. If you don't practice it, it's not gonna work. We hate to role play, we hate it. But if you wanna be able to use a lot of these skills that are human interaction, you have to find a way to role play. It's easy to install a new offense when there's no defense there. But once the defense shows up and they start blitzing, hitting you from ways that you didn't expect, it's a lot harder. And that's how life is in a lot of these interpersonal communications are. Hey, I'm not gonna lose my temper. And then you get into the conversation and wow, it's really hard to lose, not lose my temper. Uh, last thing is just this story, because I think it really talks about not only the equipment managers that you all represent, but also those that are in organizations. And this story comes from um, a, an individual who worked for a company who mined coal. And uh, what happened is the drag line bucket went down. And uh, it's a 103-yard drag, 103-yard uh, bucket, and it is vital to the operation to allow coal to continue to go to this power plant. Um, and what happened is they came in that night and the mechanic said, hey, we're going to get this bucket switched out. It was like minus 20 degrees from what I remember. And the mechanic shows up and starts working. Well, he's out there. He's a bigger guy. Probably like you all have this guy, right? A little bit bigger, big beard. And he's just a great mechanic. And he decides, hey, I'm, I'm warm. I'm not going to go get back inside because if I do, then when I come back out, I'll be colder. So he works through the night, they get the bucket switched out, which was an amazing feat. Uh, doing it in minus 20, even more amazing. Uh, he comes in and his hard hat is frozen to his head, okay? Now, from a safety standpoint, let's not, let's not you know, pick on the fact that his hard hat's uh, frozen to his head. That can be improved. He did it because it was his responsibility. The people who were in the neighboring city who probably don't even appreciate coal or the power that it provides knew nothing about it. But they stayed warm that night 
because this individual did their responsibility. Those stories exist in this industry everywhere. How often does somebody come in from the gas crews who just fixed the gas that night to keep the power on, to keep the heat on, and he walks into a restaurant that morning, tired and dirty, and people say, thank you for your service. It doesn't happen. But we can change that. We can help people who are in our industry know how important they are and how much we appreciate what they do. This will help with some of the suicide prevention. If, if, the, if the community values these people, it will change their self-worth. And we can do that. We can start here. We can remind the people who report to us when they come in after a long day as a mechanic, you can say, hey, I just want to say thank you. I know what you do, it's a lot of hard work, but it means a lot. Keeping these equipment, this equipment running makes a difference in our community, and thank you for it.